John here from Look Smart Home Inspections in New Jersey. And I had a, a, I had a client the other day, they asked me a question about what I think about people waiving inspections. And, you know, I had to give an honest answer. And basically what I think is that is bad shit crazy. Why would you do that? Even if it's a house you love and that's the only way to get that house. Here's the thing. As a home inspector, we're going to find stuff that you had no idea existed in that home. I guarantee it all the time, 100% of the time, I'm going to go into that house and I'm going to find things that you are not going to find. You have no idea existed and that's going to be a lot of big ticket stuff sometimes. So you go into a house and you probably spend 10 or 15 minutes, maybe 20 minutes walking through the house and you as a buyer, you're looking at that house and trying to picture you and your family in that home. Are, is it gonna work? Are the spaces gonna be okay? The bedroom's big enough. Is there enough family room space? Where am I gonna put the television? That kind of thing. Whereas a home inspector goes in with a completely different agenda. Our agenda is to tell you exactly what's going on in the house, good and bad, and to bring to light the problems that exist in that house that you have no idea uh, that exist. So if you're purchasing a house in New Jersey and you're spending eight, nine, a million dollars uh, on this house, I implore you, get a home inspection. Do not waive your inspection contingency because I guarantee you go into that house, there's going to be surprises and most likely expensive surprises that you don't know about. I've had people buy homes who call me after the fact and they didn't even know their home was on a crawl space. They didn't even know there was a fire in the home. They don't know that they have high levels of radon gas in the home. They don't know that they had termite damage to half of the sill plate in the basement. These things happen all the time. And not to mention water infiltration in the attic and in the basement. So look, I know that house, this market is crazy and it's crazy for everybody who makes their living, um, you know, home inspections real estate agents, mortgage brokers, anybody who makes their living in real estate right now is having a real challenge. But you as a buyer, you have to put your foot down. Please don't buy a house without a home inspection. You're doing yourself and your family a great disservice. Now, I have another defects video here. These are some of the problems that I found recently in a couple houses that I did uh, last week, the week before. Um, and I just take a look at them. Maybe you can learn something uh, as you look, uh, you know, for your own home that you're thinking about purchasing. But I implore you, do not waive that inspection contingency. Also, you know what I have found recently, and this is because we're in such a seller's market, is that most contracts are now limited to environmental safety and structure. So most people understand what safety is. So safety would be, for example, oh, that guardrail is loose. Oh, we have these live wires here by the furnace and they have to be dealt with. We'd have no handrail on the steps or the front steps are broken apart, which can constitute a safety issue. Oh, we don't have a, the required height of the fencing around the pool, right? That's safety. And then environmental, pretty straightforward too, right? So we have, okay, we found an oil tank on the property, or we have mold in the attic or mold in the basement, and then there's asbestos pipe wrap. So all those kind of things would fall into that environmental category. But kind of the open question that I find all the time is structure. So what's structure, right? Is that just confining yourself to the, you know, the wood structure of the home or the support structure of the home, the columns, the joist, the sill plate, box plate, flooring, chimney? Is that structure or can structure be the chimney? You know, can structure be a falling apart deck? Can structure be a falling apart set of steps? You know, can structure be exterior siding? Can structure be an obstructed or damaged sewer line? So here's the thing, and I think it gets very vague. I think, it, I think it needs to be more honed in. So listen, when you guys are working on your, your and you're very, you get very excited, your attorney's working to get you out of attorney review, you know, quickly, you're looking to get, you know, into this process. But I think it's important to take a step back and you guys have to sort of define what structure actually is. Because if you don't, then there's a lot of, there's a lot of gray area 
for the seller to come back and say, oh, that's not structure, or you to come and try to make your case that that's, you know, actually structure. So my advice to you guys would be, and I see this happen all the time in contracts, where we have sort of this vague definition of structure, and it's not defined. So if you guys define it in the contract, hey, you know, structure is this, 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 and this, and it also includes the plumbing, it also includes the sore line, it also includes the chimney, the porch, the, you know, the, 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 uh, the deck, anything that's around the home, you know, like that, I think you'll be doing yourself a great service. Because if we find, say the roof is 30 years old, right, and it's at its life expectancy, is that structure? To me, that's structure. But to other other attorneys or to other people in a real estate transaction, you know what? That's not structure. So unless you define what it is you're actually able to negotiate as structure, again, you're doing yourself a big disservice. So keep yourself as somebody who sees this all the time. I would highly recommend that you talk to your attorney and actually discuss and come up with a with a definition of what structure actually is. I think that's very important today. Here we're looking at a bunch of charring underneath the uh, roof structure in this attic space. So we've definitely had a fire in this attic and you would, you would think that this is a rare occurrence, but I actually find this two or three times a year. Um, see all this black wood, definitely had a fire here. And over here, they painted everything pink. I don't know if you can see the charring of the wood, but that's something that is uh, a hazard, right? Because we wanna make sure that the fire didn't compromise any of the structure. Um, so we're gonna recommend that an engineer be bought in here to determine if um, anything needs to be done. Home inspectors are not engineered, so I can't issue an engineering report. But this is something that's definitely important, uh, especially when you go ahead and sell the home. This may be a problem, obviously, for your new buyers. So charred wood all over the attic space. Hi guys, I'm under this house and we see under this built up beam charred wood in the center of this beam. So what I think happened was that there was a house fire and then they sandwiched the damaged beam uh, with two uh, additional uh, built up members here. Um, so you can see that charred wood here. So we're gonna definitely let our client know uh, that a fire has taken place in this house. Not sure when and if the structural integrity is compromised. In my opinion, it probably is, uh, but this is something you clearly don't want to see. And this is why we get under homes to look for things like this. We have this furnace located in the crawl space, which is pretty much a high moisture environment. We see this rusting that's developing inside this furnace unit. This furnace unit really isn't even that old. And especially in through here, we see this rusting developing in the burner unit. So if you have a furnace that's in a high moisture environment, you're significantly going to uh, reduce its life expectancy because it's really not made to be exposed to this high moisture that we have in the space. So uh, this furnace will have definitely a shorter life expectancy uh, than a furnace that say is located uh, in a dry basement or inside uh, the living space of a house. A lot of rusting in here. We're not really supposed to have a flexible dryer vent pipe inside a crawl space that is very difficult to enter and traverse. This should be a rigid pipe going outside and where it enters um, through the uh, crawl space floor. Uh, just for safety, uh, we don't want to get lint obstruction. We don't want to have fire hazards. So recommend to the client that this 
hidden uh, dryer vent pipe be replaced with a rigid pipe. As home inspectors, when we're looking at a bathroom floor and we see these carpetings here, we always want to make sure that we lift up because this is typically where the loose tiles missing grout are going to be. So don't be afraid to look under bathroom carpeting or area rugs, bath mats, whatever they have on the floor, because under this is likely to be where the problems exist. We see our joists here are attached to a ledger board. And when this house was built, they use this notching technique to lay the floor joist on this ledger board here. So what you guys have to watch out for is this ledger board actually pulling away due to the weight on these from this beam right here from the joist. So what happens is, and this is actually done relatively well, but what happens here is that if they put too much of a notch in these joists, then you don't have a lot of meat in the joist that's bearing properly. And we see a lot of cracking sometimes of these joists where they meet the ledger board and the beam. So keep your eyes open, uh, keep your eyes open for that type of thing where we have this sort of this older ledger board construction in these older homes. We wanna make sure that our ledger board is not pulling out, our beam, our, our joists are not pulling away from the beam, and we don't have any cracking right in that notched area, which is very vulnerable to cracking over time. Here we have an old oil-fired water heater. And these, sometimes it's difficult to determine the date on these water heater, but here we see new anode rod was installed in 2010. So if we had a new anode rod installed in 2010, that means our water heater is way past its statistical life expectancy of about 10 or 12 years. So generally these, these um, water heaters that are oil fired are gonna last a little bit longer, but you can always look for different clues on the outside of your equipment to try to figure out the age of it. And here we see 2010 for the anode rod. We definitely see some corrosion here on the inlet pipe for the water heater. And just the overall condition of a piece of equipment like this can give you an idea of its age. So we're gonna recommend that a client be proactive and change this water heater out before it becomes a, a problem, a more significant problem. And it's actually, believe it or not, not even working. So that's another issue altogether. If you guys are purchasing a home and you have an unfinished basement, I want you to look up. And if you see discoloration like this, all of this kind of potpourri of different colors that we have underneath the, uh, the subfloor, that is likely to be various molds because we're not controlling moisture well in the basement. So take a look, don't be afraid to look up, bring a flashlight if you're buying a house with a dark basement, an unfinished basement like we have here. And this is likely to be molds and we don't want this in the house. So there's likely to be necessary a mold remediation here. Now we took a sample of this material and I'm gonna send it off to a lab to verify what kind of mold exists. And if that sample does come back positive for mold, then we're gonna to have to have a mold remediation in this basement. But guys, you're buying a house with an unfinished basement, make sure you look up. Nice new patio, huh? So what we have here is a patio, but our structure, our sill plate, box plate, are below the level of this patio. And that's gonna be a real problem because we're gonna get water seepage, water infiltration, wood rot to that sill plate and box plate inside this house because our patio is constructed below our structure is actually located below the level of the patio here. So this looks nice, but what you're gonna do here is open yourself to all kinds of problems in the basement of this house. We'll go in and take a look, but I guarantee we're gonna go see some issues here, right where this patio meets the structure. We wanna have some kind of buffer zone here so our structure is not below the level of the grade, patio, any kind of masonry, because this is a vulnerable area of water infiltration problems. This is our area, our foundation wall inside. This is where the patio exists on the outside uh, that's higher than the level of the structure. 
And as we thought, we're having a lot of seepage, a lot of efflorescence, a lot of water infiltration here. So what we're gonna do now is probe this sill and box plate to make sure they're still solid. But we do have a lot of vulnerability just because of that position of the patio here, like we were just talking about a couple of minutes ago. See the water stains, efflorescence, definitely water seepage. So this is gonna be a problem over time. And um, this is not really what you wanna see because we're vulnerable to this type of thing because of the position of the patio on the outside of the house. Look at the position of this downspout right here. This is, this is creating a tripping hazard. We're running all this water across these set of steps, so we're gonna have icing conditions here, plus we've created a tripping hazard. So this is actually not what you want when you run a downspout. Ideally, what they should have done is went underneath the patio and then discharged the downspout away here, but kind of, took the shortcut and ran it just over the steps here, creating a tripping hazard and also a hazard for creating icing in front of the steps. We have to be careful with these basement walkout drain systems here. So water is gonna enter our basement walkout area, hopefully enter the drain and then be piped out to a dry well. But these drains become obstructed easily. We saw the leave cover here. Especially in the fall months, in the spring months, this drain can easily, easily become obstructed. And then we have a little bit of a swimming pool here where water can get inside our basement. So if you have a walkout drain like this or you're buying a house with a walkout drain system here, we definitely need to make sure that this drain remains unobstructed. And another thing we need to do is we need to find out where this drain goes to. Sometimes this is just a hole in the ground. Other times this actually goes out to a dry well. So if it goes out to a dry well and we have below ground piping, we need to make sure that we're able to keep that drain system properly operational. So watch out for these basement walkout drains here and keep them unobstructed and free flowing just so we don't get water inside the basement underneath our basement walkout door. Here we have a set of steps on the outside of this house. One, two, three, four, set, four steps. So what does that mean? That means we need a handrail. So the rule of thumb here is that if we have three steps, we need a handrail. Here we have four and a handrail is definitely necessary. So sometimes even insurance companies are gonna come around when you purchase a home and they're gonna take a look at any liability hazards because certainly they don't wanna pay any claims and they're gonna actually make you put a handrail on your set of steps. So you're thinking about buying a home, that's great, if you're okay with having a uh, no handrail on your set of steps, but I'm not so sure your insurance company is gonna be okay with that. So check with your insurance company and make sure that your uh, set of steps does not require a handrail because most steps with three steps or more are gonna require one. Here we have multiple screw jack style columns right here. These columns are not made for permanent use. Any column here, that you can adjust that has a screw top like this uh, can't be used for permanent use. Now we'll see these all the time being used as permanent support columns in basements, crawl space, whatever, but they are not supposed to be. So we're gonna recommend to the client that they replace these columns with actual cement filled columns to properly support the structure of the home. But we probably have about six or eight of these columns inside this house and they should be replaced just for safety. If you guys buy a house, definitely gonna come up on a home inspection, look for these screw style columns in the basement and you're likely to have to replace them.